Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bend, every tongue proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer, and we are going to teach on hope. Now that at first may not be of great interest to you, but it is one of the most important things in your life. If you have hope, you will have eternal life, very likely. And without hope, you will be in a situation where you will be manipulated to the point of doing something so self-destructive as to send you to hell. Brothers and sisters, we must receive what is called this theological virtue of hope. Let's pray right now. As you might be able to tell, I have a little uh, cold, so pray that I'll be able to speak without any difficulties. Father, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Jesus, our hope. Jesus, our life. Jesus, our love. Lord, we pray for all those people who are watching this program that everyone, without exception, will love you with all heart, all soul, all mind and all strength and each one loving his or her neighbor as himself or herself. We pray all this now in Jesus' precious and holy name. Come Holy Spirit, deliver us from the evil one. Amen. I hope you love the Bible. If you don't, I think you might change your mind. We're going to go through several letters, mostly of Paul, and we're just going to see what does the Bible say about hope. Let me give you a little definition. Hope is a desire and an expectation for the future. Not just a desire. Sometimes people desire something, but they don't think they'll ever get it. Uh, but it's a desire and an expectation. Some people are expecting something, but it's something bad. And so they don't desire it. They dread it. So it's both a desire and an expectation for things in the future. And the, really the only hope that will not leave us disappointed, that will not shoot us down, is Christian hope. Hope in Christ. Because the desires for the things of the Lord and the expectation, meaning we believe those desires are going to be fulfilled, this will only happen in Christ. So hope is a desire and expectation. You, you uh, want it, and you um, look forward to it. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Uh, you think it's a good thing. And that's what God wants to give us. It, without hope, we, we just shrill up and die. Without hope, we just don't want to go on. Without hope, we lose our confidence. Without hope, we become enslaved. Without hope, it says we, we, lose, we lose our relationship with God or we lose any opening to a relationship with God. But let me go through several passages here. I guess I would say the major book in the Bible on hope is Romans. Romans, and there are several passages. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of them because we would not have time. We'd have a 10-part series, which I guess isn't a bad idea, but we'll just do one to start with. And this is Romans 4 and verse 18. It says, Hoping against hope, Abraham believed and so became the father of many nations. 
this little sentence shows us so many insights. One is, you have to have hope as a basis for faith. Abraham was hoping against hope. He was struggling to hope, and then he believed. If you're going to receive the promises that God has made for you, the fulfillment of your life in Christ, you must believe, but you must have hope prior to believing. We say the three theological virtues are faith, hope, and love, but if you want to uh, speak of them in chronological order, they might be hope, faith, and love. Well, if you're puzzled by all that, hang on. There's a lot more scriptures. I think it'll become more clear. Romans chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. It says, Through him, that is Jesus, we have gained access by faith to the grace in which we now stand. And we boast of our hope. Hope is something that makes you feel like boasting in the good sense of the word. Hope is something that exalts you. And it says, we boast of our hope for the glory of God. We're hoping for the future. We're hoping for the glory. We're hoping for the glory of God. And then it says, we even boast of our afflictions. We know that affliction makes for endurance, and endurance for tested virtue, and tested virtue for hope. How do you get hope? Through afflictions. Not just any afflictions, everybody have hope then because everybody's afflicted, but it depends on how you deal with afflictions. If you deal with afflictions by having endurance, by persevering, that will not get you hope, but get you closer to hope. That will result in tested virtue, and then you will get hope. But we are so excited about hope that we are excited about affliction that leads to, or at least can to lead to, hope. There are a lot of people that are hopeless. They say, I don't know what to do. I have given up. I have no hope for my marriage. I have no hope for my children. I have no hope for my job. I have no hope for my future. Brothers and sisters, uh, they, they think they're going to just get this hope out of nowhere, or you can get it. Now, it won't be your work. It's theological virtue. It means it's grace. It's God doing it. But how will he do it? When you see some affliction come down, don't think that's another reason for you to be even more hopeless than ever. Take it as an opportunity for hope. If hope will lead to endurance, and it will by God's grace, and then to test it virtue, you will get hope. And this hope, Romans 5.5, 5, will not leave us disappointed because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So hope is um, confirmed by love poured out by the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's so much there to talk about. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. Creation was made subject to futility, not of its own accord, but by him who once subjected it, yet not without hope. Creation can tempt us to be hopeless. Uh, and I'm, you know, I don't mean just, you know, maybe it's a tragedy like a flood or an um, earthquake or a tornado. And, and you just say, how could something like this happen? How could people be killed at creation? That's creation leading us to hopelessness. Maybe it's just getting old. Maybe it's getting sick. That's creation. That's the physical realities. But this can leave us hopeless, but it doesn't have to. It says, yes, um, creation is subject to futility. It does lead to hopelessness, but it doesn't have to. And it says, it is not without hope. Now, how in the world is that going to happen? Romans 8 and 24. In hope, we were saved. This is a bit ambiguous, at least this translation is. Does it mean we are hoping and then we get saved? Or we get saved and that puts us in an atmosphere of hope? That's not crystal clear. But it says hope is not hope if its object is seen. When you're dealing in faith, you're dealing with the invisible, and it is also true of hope. Hope and faith have this much in common that they are both dealing with the invisible. And hoping for what we cannot means awaiting it for what, for what we cannot see, 
means awaiting it with patient endurance. Now, we said in Romans 5 that endurance would lead to tested virtues that would lead to hope, but then that hope will lead to greater endurance. So do you see an interplay between hope and endurance? And when your hope is up, your endurance gets better, and your hope gets better, and your endurance gets better, and you're in this wonderful ascending spiral. But when your hope goes down or your endurance goes down, whichever goes down first, well, then the other thing starts getting affected, and you're in this terrible, devastating, descending spiral. All right. The Bible, oh, the Bible is so fantastic here. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice in hope. When you get more and more hope, you're going to get not only love to confirm it, but joy. Not only endurance before it, but endurance after it. Rejoice in hope. Romans 15, 4. Now this is more about how do you get hope. We talked about affliction, endurance, and tested virtue. But here's more detail about how do you get hope. Romans 15, 4. Everything written before our time was written for our instruction that we might derive hope from the lessons of patience and the words of encouragement in the scriptures. Yes, the scriptures, especially certain parts of the scriptures about patience, that is suffering, and about encouragement, these are parts of the Bible from which, by the grace of God, we derive hope. Praise God. All right, Romans 15 and verse 13. So may God, listen to this, the source of hope, it all comes from God. You can't get hope by your own power, but this does give us some detail about how God will work. And it says, God is the source of hope, Romans 15 and 13. May he fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that through the power of the Holy Spirit you may have hope in abundance. So you can get some hope, but you can get more hope. In fact, you can get hope in abundance. All right, that's Romans. We could talk about it more. It's fantastic. That's all we can say. 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. I already referred to this. There are three things that last. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So there is a connection between faith and hope and hope and love. And the more we understand that connection, the better off we will be. 1 Corinthians and 15, 19, it says, If our hopes, there it is in the plural in this translation, I hope the translation is correct, if our hopes in Christ are limited to this life only. See, we're talking about hope for the future, but not just on this earth. Even beyond this earth, if our hopes in Christ are limited to this life only, we are the most pitiable of men. You've got to get hope that goes beyond death. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians and chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians 3, 12, it says, Our hope being such, we speak with full confidence. So when we got hope, and he's talking about glory, as he talked about glory in Romans in chapter, um, was it 5? It says, our hope being such, we speak with full confidence. So when we got hope, we got joy. When we got hope, we got confidence. When we got hope, we see some love. Oh, brothers and sisters, what a power, a catalyst. Hope is. That's what virtue means. Virtue means a power. All right, next one. Let's, there's an amazing passage here in um, Galatians. This starts to give us a little more understanding of the connection between faith, hope, and love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. Galatians 5, verse 5. It says, It is in the Spirit that we eagerly await the justification we hope for. And only faith can yield it. It talks about having hope, but you don't get your hope realized without faith. Faith yields the justification that we are hoping for. Galatians 5 and 6, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor the lack of it counts for anything, only faith which expresses itself through love. So here we see how hope seems to precede faith, 
only faith can yield what we already have hoped for, but it seems that, that faith then precedes love because faith is expressed in love. So the faith seems to be there first. Well, there's a lot to that there, but let me jump on to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Here's a prayer for hope. May he enlighten your innermost vision. That's what we're trying to do right now. That you may know the great hope. I like that adjective, great. Don't just settle for some. Don't just settle for a little bit. Let's get some great hope to which he has called you. You have to be enlightened inside. And when you know the great hope to which God has called you, you are going to be a different person. You'll be able to endure what you never could endure. You'll be able to have confidence where you didn't have confidence. You'll be able to uh, just uh, have a joy in your life. You'll be motivated. You'll be moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll have zeal for the gospel. Oh, thank you for hope. Uh, some people don't even pray for that. They talk about, I hope I have faith. I want to have love. But brothers and sisters, this is really good stuff. Some people call the Second Vatican Council the Council of Hope. You look at one teaching after the other in that council, and it just keeps talking about hope. They give a, a new title to Mary, at least new to me, maybe new to everybody, the last chapter of the document on the church. And they say, Mary, sure sign of hope. Hope. All right. Look at Ephesians. I did 118. Let's look at 212. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says, You were strangers to the covenant and its promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. Without hope and without God. Brothers and sisters, hope so important that if you don't have it, I don't, you won't have God. You've got to have it. You've just got to have it. God will give it to you. All right, another one, Ephesians 4.4. 4. This shows you just how central hope is to God's plan of salvation. It talks about the main thing. It says in 4.4, 4, there's one body, one spirit, just as there is one hope given all of you by your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. They only mention seven things here. Three of them are the Trinity, the, Lord, the, the one God and Father, the Lord and the Spirit. And the other ones, the, the body, hope, and faith and baptism. I think that puts uh, hope in a pretty uh, elite grouping, doesn't it? Oh, you say, I, I'm starting to think hope's really a big thing. I hope you are. <laughs> I, oh, brothers and sisters, it's so good. Look at Colossians and chapter 1, verse 4. Colossians 1, verse 4. I just thank God for his word. We wouldn't know any of this stuff if it wasn't, hadn't been for him telling us. It says, we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you bear toward all the saints moved as you are by the hope held in store for you in heaven. So they talk about faith, then they talk about love, and then they talk about hope. But they spend more time on hope because it says in Colossians 1.5, you heard of this hope through the message of truth. Hope seems to be highlighted here, not apart from faith and love, but just kind of like the main thing. Because you can see, you got to have hope to have the basis of love. I'm going to, excuse me, of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is, this is a New American translation, the old edition. Faith is confident assurance about things that we hope for. You got the hope as a material, material for even to have faith. Well, we were going to, we're going to get to Hebrews in just a minute, but I just wanted to give you a preview there. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. This just tells you how great hope is. We said God just works out hope and it's a virtue. It's inside of you. Yes, it is. But, um, you know, it says in the Bible, God is love. It doesn't say God is faith. God is love. Well, here it says God, meaning Christ, is hope. You heard that a hundred times. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God. Well, in Colossians 1, 27, it says, God has willed to make known to them the glory beyond price, which this mystery brings to the Gentiles, the mystery of Christ in you, your hope of glory. Christ in you is your hope of glory. So you can say Christ, especially insofar as he is in you, is hope, is your hope, the hope of glory. Now that puts hope in a very elite class. There's only the love, God is love, and then there is God is hope. 
Praise God. All right. Further on here, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. Once again, we see faith, faith, hope, and love. We constantly are mindful before our God and Father of the way you are proving your faith and laboring in love. Now notice they have the same order as they have in Colossians. Faith, love, and hope. And showing constancy of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So hope is something that you can lose and something you can gain. We said you could have abundant hope. You could have great hope. So it's something that changes. And, and God wants it to be constant, meaning constantly changing for the better, but never changing for the worse. But that, the reason they mentioned hope last is because, you know, the last is the, usually the part of a, uh, of a development that is most emphatic. So there's a, there's a real emphasis on hope here in Colossians and in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, you can see it by the order as they put faith, hope, and love together. So it's kind of funny we put faith, hope, and love together based on 1 Corinthians 13, but really I think there's other passages that should say hope, faith, and love. That's what Galatians says. That's what uh, Romans seems to indicate, uh, Romans 5. But then 1 Thessalonians and Colossians would say faith, love, and hope. But, but, but either way, hope is emphasized in these particular orders. All right, another one. This is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. We should have you be clear about those who sleep in death, brothers, otherwise you might yield to grief like those who have no hope. Without hope, guess what? We yield. We give in. We get manipulated. We get used. We hurt ourselves. We yield to grief. Brothers and sisters, we have to always, even under the worst conditions, be people of hope proclaiming hope. You tell a person that you're on the way to hell, but there's hope. There's hope. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. You tell a person that they're going to die, but there's hope because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Always give people hope. That doesn't mean you don't tell them the truth about life, but always tell them that part of this truth is hope. Okay, we're going to move on now to Hebrews, and in Hebrews there is a, a major teaching on hope. I already mentioned Hebrews uh, 11, and, uh, but I'm going to look at um, Hebrews 6 and look at maybe verse 11. Our desire is that each of you show the same zeal till, till, till the end, Fully assured of that for which you hope. When you hope, you've got zeal. You've got assurance. You've got confidence. You've got energy. You've got motivation. You've got joy. You've got the basis for faith. You see why you need hope. And you see why the devil tries to make us hopeless. He specializes in despair. All right. Hebrews in chapter 6, same chapter. Verses 18 and 19, I love this. It says, they mention two things, God's promise and God's oath. About um, God's promise and oath about, about his plan in our life. And it says, these two things are unchangeable. And it says, we who have taken refuge in him might be strongly encouraged to seize the hope which is placed before us. The hope means this, um, as I said before, this expectation and desire for the things of the future. And God's promises and God's oath together inspire us, encourage us strongly to seize the hope. Yes, hope is a gift, but it's something we have to reach out and grab. Seize the hope which is placed before us. God will just put that hope before us in his promises, in his oath. The word sacrament is Latin for oath. And he puts those things right in front of us and says, I want you to seize the hope that these things are pointing you towards. 
And then it says, when you do that, it says, like a sure and firm anchor, that hope extends beyond the veil. That means beyond this, this earthly life. So, uh, brothers and sisters, hope gives you a sure and a firm anchor. All right, we're running out of time. Let's jump down to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, He who in His great mercy gave us new birth, a birth unto hope. When you're born again, guess what you get out of it? Hope. Hope, which draws its life from the resurrection. Hope draws its life from the resurrection. Hope gets stronger. Hope gets more abundant from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we should keep holy the Lord's day. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It says that, so gird the loins of your understanding. Come on, understanding, get ready to go. Live soberly and set all your hope, all your hope on the gift to be, to be, to be conferred on you when Jesus Christ appears. All our hope is on Jesus' second coming and the gift of eternal life. Set all your hope on it, not part of your hope. Set it all. Set it all. That's what you do with hope. You set it all on Jesus' second coming. All right, our final scripture as we run out of time. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Excuse me, verse, yes, verse uh, 15. Should anyone ask you the reason for this hope of yours? Our hope is so amazing. People come up and say, there's something about you. What is it? They, they ask questions and say, uh, I don't know exactly how to explain it. What, you got, you got a, you got a kind of a hope about you, and they say, "Where did you get this? How, what is this?" Here, hope is the basis for evangelization. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for telling us about hope, Lord. We know that this gives us a chance to seize the hope before us. May we seize it and bear fruit abundantly in hope, and rejoice in hope, and be motivated in hope, and be zealous in hope. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power